Good morning, everyone. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. Could do better than that. Uh, (laughs) Welcome to this fireside chat. I have to say, it seems a bit odd to be having a fireside chat when it's about 80 degrees and 80% humidity, but there you go. (laughs) Uh, It's really a great honor for me to introduce uh, Dr. Francis Collins, who's the director of the National Institutes of Health, uh, to be our speaker or chatter today. And uh, it's a particular honor, of course, because I, I actually worked with Francis for a number of years. And many of you were here last evening, and I won't uh, try and repeat the, the, the wonderful words that Rick Shannon uh, used to describe Francis and his uh, long history of science. But it's just fair to say um, that Francis is definitely one of uh, the world's leading scientists. And uh, I have to say uh, his work on the Human Genome Project Um, Before that, work on uh, particularly gene loci that related to disease, cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease, uh, were actually fundamental developments uh, in in healthcare. And now, of course, uh, for the last eight or nine years, he's led uh, the National Institutes of Health. uh, And that's been um, my three years of observation there uh, was just really quite eye-opening. Coming from being a researcher to uh, actually be part of the leadership and seeing what transpires every day with Francis at the interface between uh, the executive branch and Congress and all of us as scientists. We are extremely lucky to have him in that position. Um, I'd also add on a personal note that uh, working with him for three years was an absolute delight and I learned an enormous amount. So thank you very much for coming, Francis, and uh, it's just an honor to have you here. Well. Well, Phil, if I may, it's a joy to be here and to be back at my alma mater and to be hosted by you uh, and the contributions you made to us over those three years as the Associate Director for Data Science, really getting NIH out of where we had been, which was behind the times, uh, into something much more forward-looking and positive. And I know we're going to talk about that. Uh, It was a great gift that you gave to all of us. And we mourned it when uh, the University of Virginia figured out how to lure you down Route 29 to Charlottesville. But now having the chance to see what you and others are building here, it's truly exciting uh, to see how the University of Virginia is on this rising curve in data science, in neuroscience, in a wide variety of other areas. It's wonderful to see an institution that I care so deeply about uh, finding itself into this uh, remarkable moment of opportunity. So it's a pleasure to be here. And thanks for the chance uh, to spend a little time with you. Thank you. It is, I've, in my five months here, come to realize it's an absolute wonderful place. And I, you know, we, it's wonderful colleagues that I have working with us here, and it's just re- really enjoyable. The theme of, and we can drift a little uh, on this theme, but the real theme is uh, the notion of where data science and analytics fit into the future of biomedical research and healthcare. And uh, we're going to have a little chat about that, and then the idea is to open up the floor uh, to, to various questions about that. So I was going to ask you just to get the ball rolling, uh, to sort of look backwards uh, with respect to uh, how open data and sharing and analytics have, have played into particularly your own work and then your, your leading of the Human Genome Project. Because my, my sort of feeling about it all as a computational biologist was I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for the Human Genome Project, because I think that was what really sort of precipitated this, this use and, and the desire to have open data. So I'm wondering if whether you could sort of comment on that history and, and sort of give us some insights into what worked and what didn't work, perhaps. Sure. I can't resist, though, saying a little bit, going even further back, since we are here uh, at UVA, where I spent four years uh, as an undergraduate because I think my own interests in data and data analytics were born during that time when I was here as a chemistry major, uh, learning from uh, remarkable teachers, uh, Dr. Grimes, Dr. Bloor, uh, Carl Trendle, who was my senior advisor when I was a uh, senior student trying to figure out how to do research. And what interested me most was actually the analytical part, the mathematical part. Quantum mechanics was the thing that I fell in love with. Second order differential equations seems like the closest thing to beauty that I could encounter. (laughs) 
although now I barely can remember how that worked, but I spent a lot of time in uh, the computer center, which was the only place you could compute uh, over uh, there in the computer center where they had a Burroughs B5500. And you could do your own programming on these cards and carry them around in boxes and feel very important. Thank goodness we're not doing it that way anymore. But it was clear to me that science was going to be really satisfying if it was connected to digital information. And that's why I love physics and that's why I love chemistry. And life science for me seemed way too messy to get engaged with. And it took me a long time to figure out that actually there was an opportunity there as well. Not until I was well along with a PhD in physical chemistry at Yale did I discover that life science was calling to me and ended up in medical school. And there, the synthesis of the remarkable opportunity to understand at some level how cells do what they do and how organisms like humans do what they do with the science of genetics, with its incredibly digital nature and its mathematical opportunities, that was like it. And so a lot of students here probably trying to figure out what is it going to be for them. It will emerge. I don't know what it'll be. And it might change 10 years later, but there is such opportunity right now in terms of the way in which uh, the convergence uh, of sciences is bringing us to a place where things can happen. The Human Genome Project was such a convergence. Uh, I was at the University of Michigan uh, trying to find the causes of genetic disorders like cystic fibrosis, which you mentioned. Those of you in this room who take for granted that the human genome is available with a click of a mouse can probably not even imagine how horrible it was to try to sift through three billion letters of DNA when you didn't have very many of them. You had less than 1%. And you didn't even quite know their arrangement on chromosomes. To find that cystic fibrosis gene uh, took us five years and burned out several postdocs along the way because you thought you had something and you got excited and then it all fell apart. And then you thought you had something else. Oh, that fell apart. And it took forever for something that was a very well-behaved, uh, well-understood autosomal recessive disease. And clearly that was not going to be scalable if we were serious about unraveling genetic risk factors for much more complicated problems like diabetes or heart disease. So the Genome Project from me was emerging as an opportunity to make possible something that otherwise was just not going to happen. I didn't expect, however, that I'd be asked to come and take the helm of this effort. You might remember or not that the first leader of the Human Genome Project was none other than Jim Watson of Watson and Crick. A uh, pretty nice way to sort of span a career between discovering the structure of DNA and then being asked to lead the enterprise to read out that instruction book. Uh, and Jim did a great job of getting things started off, but ran into a bit of a tangle uh, with uh, his inability to necessarily restrain himself when he had something he wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after he called uh, the current NIH director a lunatic in front of an open microphone for the third time, uh, that was kind of like <laughs> it. And that's when I got this call saying, hey, how would you uh, like to be the one? <laughs> Uh, it's good to know you've been much more diplomatic going forward. <laughs> it may have been my main attractive characteristic at that point. So uh, tell, tell us a little about the open data aspect of, and how that has sort of fed into the well, thinking then and now going forward. Yeah, very important because that's what we're here to talk about. So basically the Genome Project got started uh, with a huge number of challenges ahead of us. We didn't have the technology to even begin to think about sequencing three billion letters of DNA. So we had to first develop the technologies, work on simpler organisms, uh, E. coli, uh, yeast, uh, and Drosophila, uh, and uh, so on, C. elegans. Uh, but we did finally, by about 1996, got to the point where it was time to start sequencing human DNA. There was a critical meeting. Uh, we pulled all the sequencing groups together, and at that point there were about 20 labs working on this in six countries, uh, to decide, well, what was the strategy and particularly, what were we going to do about making the data available? Now, this is 1996. The norm at that point in terms of data access for people working in life sciences was, well, at the time of publication, maybe. And not always as open at the time of publication as it should be. But certainly the idea of releasing your data ahead of that was unprecedented. But here we were in a circumstance where 
a publication on the human genome undoubtedly was going to lie several years in the future. And yet the sequencing machines were turning out data every day that potentially might be useful to somebody. So do we let those 20 labs that are doing the work have the opportunity uh, to get the cream here and figure out what's there and withhold that from everybody else? Or do we do something radical, which is to decide to give it away? And there was an intense debate that day, and I still have <laughs> a photograph of what was written on the whiteboard about what the uh, issues were and what the conclusion might be. And with leadership, particularly from uh, Bob Waterston, who was at that time at WashU, and John Solston from the UK, uh, the group, with a little bit of screaming from some of the members, came around uh, to the right answer. And I'm happy to say I helped with that, although it was good that it was coming up from the center directors themselves. And that was, we would start giving the data away every 24 hours. As soon as there was an assembly of a kilobase of information, it would go up on the server, and anybody who wanted to see it could do so. That was radical at the time, but it was a moment. And I think it basically set in place a series of steps that became now the sort of normal ethic of how one is supposed to handle projects like this, where you are using a lot of resources to generate a data set that is going to empower lots of investigators, and the sooner they get access to it, the more it makes sense. That was followed up by a broader meeting, a Fort Lauderdale meeting, where we had a conversation. Is it just about DNA sequence, or should this be about other things in genomics? And the answer was, yes, it should be. If it's a community research project that is basically going to benefit the community, there is no reason, no excuse, to keep the data hidden away as soon as you know that it's of sufficient quality that people are going to find it useful. And that's become our norm. So that Bermuda Accord initially kicked things off and then I think we fast forward and we see what's happened and what the NIH has been so incredibly instrumental in doing is providing a series of resources of open data through the National Center for Biotechnology Information and, and, and other places within individual institutes which I think have had profound impacts on the, the speed of, and the ability to do science. But notwithstanding, coming to the sort of present, uh, there is still, it, it, this is not universal across, the thinking around this is not universal across no. all of biomedicine. It's not. And we know from, you know, not that long ago, editorials in the New England Journal of Medicine where we, we saw the notion of data parasites which actually got a visceral reaction, which I think in, in the end probably did open data a great service. Um, but perhaps you could comment a little on, uh, particularly is it uh, how this has evolved in other, other areas that are covered by the NIH, but also particularly because of the implications around human subjects data. Uh, and th that obviously creates certain limitations, but at the same time is so important to, to make available. So there's this, there's this natural tension there. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll talk about uh, the way in which this evolved uh, to the next level involving human data, but also the risk of uh, the, a, the producers of the data being scooped by others who had not generated it, which was a lot of the concern. And this was around the whole process of looking across the genome to find genetic variations that contributed risk for common disease, the so-called genome-wide association study, GWAS studies. Once we had a catalog of human variation from the HapMap study, people began to look at thousands of individuals who had a disease and thousands of controls who otherwise well matched but didn't have the disease and looked across the genome to say, are there in fact variants that seem to be associated with risk? And will that tell us something about pathogenesis? And this continues to this day to be an enormously productive way of understanding pathways involved in previously poorly understood diseases. But okay, how does this apply there? If you've worked uh, for the last 15 years to collect a data set of cases and controls and characterize their phenotypes with great detail, and then you have the opportunity with this new uh, set of variants uh, to do a GWAS and see what you find, are you obligated uh, to put that data immediately into the public domain, or are there reasons to think about that? Well, one is, of course, the patient confidentiality. Uh, those involve uh, phenotypic information from real people whose consent may or may not have been designed for this moment to arrive. So you have to kind of go through that process of are you treating your research participants with respect? Uh, that generally can be negotiated in a way that the data is presented in an anonymized fashion 
but you still don't want researchers getting access to it without making an agreement that they're not going to try to identify the individuals. There has to be some assertion and an agreement by the researchers using the data that they're going to respect the patient's confidentiality. And that we can get across by having some sort of review process uh, for researchers who want access to the data uh, to be scrutinized by a data access committee and then granted access or not, depending on whether they are approaching this uh, in an appropriate way. But the other question is, what about the investigators who maybe spent the last decade and a half of their life getting ready for this moment and they've generated the data, but they still have some work to do to try to analyze it and then come up with a publication that's going to go through various levels of review. This was quite a hot one. And um, there were many investigators who thought it was outrageous that they would not be able to just hang on to the data as long as they wanted to and basically only release it at the time of their big publication. Uh, NIH made the decision uh, that we would not fund studies uh, of this sort unless the data was made accessible uh, within six months uh, after the time that the last data point had been collected. That gives time for the data to be cleaned up. But generally, after six months, the publication's not out yet. Um, and that actually turned out to be a very good experiment. Uh, the investigators, uh, with only one or two exceptions, uh, their interest in publishing their data themselves was honored, was respected by the rest of the community. There was very little of this feared circumstance where people were going to jump in and scoop people. But it did give a chance for the whole research community to begin to build on the information without waiting what might have been another year or more uh, for the data to actually find its way into print. So that model, admittedly, for a specific thing called GWASH, got us uh, one level further uh, towards how to handle this. Yeah, and I, I think that those were really important developments. So let's sort of now begin. I mean, I think, and so what, what's fundamentally changing is the actual amount of data that's coming from every imaginable direction. Oh, yeah. Uh, obviously, mobile devices, uh, and, and all of this is uh, being fed into the All of Us, which you talked about last night, and I'm sure you could say some more about. Yes. But, I mean, what's happening if you look outside of biomedicine is that it's, it is the data economy. The, the governor of this state speaks about data is the new oil, data is the new soil. Uh, so do other people. Uh, and there's no question uh, that that, to some degree, is happening. It's beginning to drive economies and, and thinking. And if you talk to a variety of companies, even ones that you wouldn't necessarily expect, they will say, we are now you know, data analytics companies. And you could, you know, so projecting that, I mean, you could actually, I would provocatively say, uh, you could say that you know, biomedicine is going to become a data analytical business. And I don't know how you, that, you feel about that, or, uh, but it would be interesting to get your perspective. And then perhaps we could weave in some of the things that have happened or are happening or you propose to happen at the NIH around this. That's a, that's a big mouthful. So. It's a big mouthful, but it's a big data issue. And, and it is very much a dominant part of how I see the future of biomedical research. We used to think of biomedicine as being sort of small-scale producer of data compared to, say, high-energy physics uh, or satellite photos uh, or whatever your favorite example was of who was producing uh, a lot of terabytes. But we have emerged now, I think, as the fastest growing and pretty soon the largest producer of really enormous data sets. And that is a great opportunity. <laughs> Some people look at it as a problem. Heck no, this is a fantastic moment but it is not going to emerge in a way that contributes knowledge as opposed to just information uh, unless we organize it appropriately. At NIH, uh, where there are 27 institutes and centers, each of which has a director, uh, we gather around our institute's table uh, every week uh, to talk about what are the most emerging and critical issues for us to pay attention to. We will meet tomorrow, Phil, and you'll miss it this time. He used to have to go through these. <laughs> We meet tomorrow at 7 a.m., and guess what we're talking about? We're talking about data science uh, for two hours uh, with presentations uh, from the National Library of Medicine, from uh, this pilot effort we have of putting some very large data sets into the cloud, along with the analytics to enable a uh, test of how that's going to work uh, for data sets and include genotypes as well as phenotypes as well as images. Uh, and uh, we'll hear about what, we're, what our progress looks like it needs to be from a, a scientific data council, which is a group of institute directors who are trying to predict where we need to go. 
And as you know, because we asked you to lead this effort when you came three years ago to NIH, we are now spending over $100 million a year of additional resources uh, to try to push this enterprise forward where it needs to go. It is the most critical, most rapidly moving part of the entire biomedical research enterprise. And it crosses uh, through the basic science arena, whether it's genomics, all the way to clinical trials, uh, everything in between. And if we do it right, uh, we are going to be in a circumstance of catalyzing uh, a wealth of new discoveries about life and about disease. If we do it wrong, we're going to frustrate the heck out of everybody. And so we need all hands on deck. And I might say we need a lot of talent to come and assist with this. And I'm sure that's true in every academic institution as well. Our bench is not nearly as deep as it should be at NIH in data science, as you know, because you helped us recruit some, but we got to recruit a lot more. So by the way, if there are <laughs> students here who are looking for a really great job in public service and at being at the center of the center of biomedical research, uh, send me an email. I think we could find a place for you. I, well, I have to say that I will, I, I, I will miss, I miss those discussions. I don't miss wearing a tie sitting there at 7 in the morning, but that's another matter. <laughs> uh, so that, that's because there are so many young people in the audience who are, are thinking about this. Um, I know when the, the, the big data to knowledge initiative, which is that uh, pot of money you just mentioned, that we tried to devote about 20% of that to training. Mm -hmm. And clearly, that was, that was making inroads, but it, in some ways, it's not enough. And it's not just about the money. It's also about uh, attitudes and, and having, you know, having suitable mentors. And I, don't, I think we're, we're in this sort of difficult situation of not, not necessarily, and it's true at the institutional level, not necessarily having enough mentors because in this field that's moving so quickly. Uh, and I don't know particularly good answers to that. Uh, our own approach to this and, uh, is to kind of bring in uh, what we would call, for example, uh, professors of practice who are people uh, in the private sector who were in many cases in areas of data science uh, are, are quite ahead of what's going on within academia. And then they, you know, they, they can then provide the best practices to uh, to our, both our faculty, but also to our students, and then the process starts to perpetuate. So I think the, I, the idea of NIH uh, somehow engaging in that kind of activity uh, seems to me to be potentially positive. I don't know what, what you feel about that. Totally but. agree. <clears throat> We've had some very interesting conversations with people in Silicon Valley, some of the well-recognized leaders in that effort, people like Eric Schmidt, uh, asking sort of what would their advice be about how we make opportunities uh, for talented data science up-and-comers uh, to actually migrate in the direction of biomedical research as opposed to something else which might be more traditionally and uh, well, well supplied with uh, mentors in, in some uh, Silicon Valley environment. Because I do think, from what I can tell, talking to a lot of uh, data science trainees, and they're excited about the field of opportunity, but they want to be sure that where they land in the field has a real impact in a way that's beneficial to humanity. And I don't think you can beat the life science applications if that's your goal. And the opportunities there, many of which are currently not getting the attention they deserve, are enormous. And there's some massive projects that really would inspire somebody who wants to take on something hard to come and join. So for instance, the brain. We are engaged in this effort to actually figure out how those 86 billion neurons between your ears do what they do, uh, and each one of them having maybe a thousand connections. So this is an incredibly complicated system, maybe the most complicated structure in the known universe. And we have technologies that are being invented daily to enable you to understand how circuits in the brain do very complicated things, but we're never going to make sense out of it unless we have the sort of big data approach of getting that information in a place where you could begin to deduce how those circuits actually function and what goes wrong with them in particular disease. Now, that's a really interesting and hard problem that I would think a data scientist would love to engage in. Uh, take the All of Us program you mentioned, uh, which I talked about last night, the ability to enroll over the next couple of years a million Americans in a prospective longitudinal cohort study where their electronic health records and their complete genome sequences and lots of other laboratory data and wearable sensor data is all going to be accessible to researchers who are qualified, who go through the appropriate process of making sure that they're legitimate. Uh, that is going to be a data science uh, absolute 
frenzy of activity, but it's going to take very sophisticated uh, approaches to actually learn as quickly as we can. Uh, what, what does that teach us about how people stay healthy or what to do if they fall ill or how to prevent that illness in the first place? Uh, all of those opportunities that are there. What Schmidt and others said was, we should really make an effort to reach out to data science communities. I'm reaching out here, can you tell? Uh, to, to encourage people to think about those kinds of, of uh, activities, whether they're in an academic center or whether you come to NIH and work with us in Bethesda, this is the moment uh, to really try uh, to tackle those big problems. And in a place that has a lot of expertise, maybe we don't have enough mentors who are sort of senior experts uh, in all of the data science disciplines, but we have experts who are pretty good at a lot of other things. And in many ways, maybe that's the kind of mentoring somebody particularly needs if they're going to move their data science expertise, their ability to, to code uh, into life science. They need to be sure the life science understanding is also really thoroughly fundamental and understood. Otherwise, you kind of ask the wrong question and you get an answer that doesn't matter so much. I mean, one of the uh, aspects that I've enjoyed very much in my a brief time here that I wasn't really aware of before, which might be a good model to think about uh, interfacing with the NIH, is the, the capstone models that we use. So what happens now is that students, and particularly in the Data Science Institute, or many of whom are here, uh, is they do, a, in their 11-month master's program, they do an eight-month uh, capstone project where they actually work, and they're working typically with uh, private sector companies, and in many cases, they go and work for those companies. I think if we open that up more to really uh, engage NIH investigators in, uh, in this kind of uh, endeavor, and it, it sort of addresses the interface because they, they're essentially learning on the job but they're learning a lot of what they need to know in biomedicine and applying that and taking their own knowledge, which they're getting from mentors here, in analytics that uh, really sort of moves the whole ball forward. So it, I think some kinds of programs like that would be really I very I think welcome. we would welcome the chance to talk about that. When, when you look at um, the workforce needs, there must be a workforce economists who are doing this. Uh, where are we in terms of what is going to be estimated as the need for well-trained data scientists 10 years from now and the path we're on. Are we desperately behind? We are desperately behind. I thought so. I mean, you only have to just, um, the students can testify that in the previous years. Uh, you know, we have a wonderful career placement uh, person, Reggie Leonard, and you know, he, he does a great job, but you know, basically there's, the, the world is their oyster. Mm -hmm. There are so many open jobs out there just in, when I left, this is even two or three, well, more than that now, three or four years ago, just in Southern California, uh, in, 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 in biomedical uh, areas of data science, uh, there were four and a half thousand unfilled jobs. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that na nationwide, uh, it's, it's, you know, well, I would say, I can't remember exactly how, but hundreds of thousands at least. Mm -hmm. So there's, it, there's you know, the, the, the supply is far outweighed by the demand. And so I think that you know, we're trying to begin to address that. Uh, and we're doing that in various ways with joint programs um, with, other, with other areas of the university. Um, and I think that those, all of that needs to grow. And I think it, it, perhaps we've been a little slow to get off the ground in some areas. And the Data Science Institute is certainly ahead in all of this. But uh, schools are now working with us to actually develop programs uh, with a broad swath. So, and certainly, uh, within the health system, I think we've got um, you know, very good partners in moving these things forward and, and doing better training. Another aspect of training is while you have, and appropriately so, uh, this focused area on data science, a data science institute, a master's degree, anybody who's currently in a training program for life sciences, uh, even though they don't expect to be a card-carrying data scientist, is going to have to be at least pretty familiar with uh, the opportunities for applying a computational strategy for whatever they're working on. <clears throat> Anybody who goes through a PhD program in life sciences and doesn't come out of it being quantitatively comfortable uh, with a computational approach is not getting the kind of training that they should have uh, for 2017 and beyond. And I worry that there's still lots of programs that have not embraced that. Uh, anybody who leaves uh, a PhD program without having a pretty good idea about how to use R 
is maybe not well suited uh, for what comes next. And I'm not sure that across all of academic departments uh, that realization has sunk in. I, I think that mm -hmm. even extends, we've had discussions that every, every student, whatever their <coughs> discipline at the undergraduate level, should have some level of analytical skills because it doesn't matter what they do in politics, other branches of humanities, that it's going to be a requirement. And you know, ours is certainly part of that. Uh, there's even a school of thought that maybe there ought to be more of that, and certainly it's going on in some school districts where they're teaching this actually at the school level. I love that. Yeah, and that's obviously where it has to start. I have sort of asked you about closing thoughts when we get there, but I think what we'd like to do now is really uh, partly because, of course, I am not a Charlie Rose, and uh, Francis, <laughs> Fra Francis had a, a lot of experience with a real, really uh, experienced uh, interviewers, and I'm definitely not one of those. So you're, I, I'm, you're doing a great Oprah imitation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I assume I think that yeah, I take that as a compliment. Really. <laughs> uh, uh, so I think it'd be really good to just open up because it's really your session. So it'd be really good to hear questions from the people we've, uh, from the audience here. Uh, we've got microphones floating around, which is actually quite hard to see. Here they are. So we, we'd really like to take your questions. And we have a hard time even seeing who's yeah, out I've there. Got, so oh, uh, I think I, I see, see someone one. over there. Uh, hi, thank you so much. This was a, a wonderful session. My name is Sana Sayed. I'm an assistant professor in pediatric GI. And I was wondering, um, so you alluded to for junior trainees and junior faculty, a good question is where you land in the field and having a big impact. So I was wondering, um, what are your thoughts about making inferences from big data enough to change policy and practice? And kind of to what extent do we still need to pursue mechanistic studies? Because I, I hear a lot of debate about that, um, especially at a junior faculty level, whether um, what is sort of the marriage of young people wanting to go into research and doing basic science mechanistic work versus um, harvesting um, big data and doing um, computational approaches? Uh, well, I would say it's not either or, it's both and. We are still going to need vast amounts of understanding about function, which comes from basic science uh, mechanistic studies. But we also have the opportunity, more than ever, uh, to look further downstream uh, with big data and analytics uh, about how things work in terms of something as complicated as how the cell does what it does, but also learning from clinical data. Um, maybe part of your question also is, uh, can we count on big data observational studies that now take advantage of access to vast amounts of electronic health records to be able to actually change policies or make conclusions about what is uh, working and what's not working? Is that good enough, or are we still going to need randomized controlled trials? I think most of the time we're going to need randomized control trials, but they might be cluster trials and they might be pragmatic trials. But observational studies alone will be great at hypothesis generation, but it'll be hard to be absolutely sure that you don't have confounders uh, all scattered throughout your data set that you haven't been able to observe and correct for. I'm not sure exactly that's where you're taking your question, but I, I felt like I wanted to make the point anyway. So I hope that's <laughs> You're our guest, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> I, I, I would say that there's sort of a, a synergy. I think you know, we shouldn't get tied up, and you and I had a bit of this conversation walking over, uh, about the, you know, the, there's a lot of promise around so-called big data, but we know how these things get oversold. And I think it's very important to remember the virtuous cycle of that anything that appears to come out of analysis of this big data really uh, needs to be tested uh, and looked at experimentally and also, of course, looked at very carefully, particularly as it relates to, to human health and how this gets applied. Uh, so, can. you know, you can definitely jump forward to making uh, dangerous conclusions and I think we, uh, the regulation associated with that, of course, is a whole other can of worms, which we yeah. could, I'm sure you could talk about for hours. <laughs> we, we, used to to. we used to <laughs> talk about for hours. Um, <laughs> But let's, let's not get bogged down in that. So other questions? What would you say is the biggest bottleneck in getting big transformative research science done? Is it, um, you were talking about the Human Genome Project and other projects, how like, it seems like that was a very different structure than how most science gets done. It's, it seems like it's usually, um, handful of labs here and they are all working on similar projects and 
you know, after several months of doing research, publishing something, and someone reads it, and it seems like it takes a while. I don't know if a uh, human genome project would have been a uh, you know, several year project that it was if we had gone with that method. Um, so I don't know if is the structure a uh, bottleneck, or is it the number of data scientists, uh, the quality, availability of data, something else? Uh, it's probably all of the above. I think when it comes to projects, it's important to figure out what is the right team structure to get the particular task uh, move forward at the most appropriate pace. Um, I, I guess, particularly am associated with these big science projects because of the genome project and some of the things that have come after that, like HapMap and a thousand genomes and the microbiome project. And NIH has this component called the Common Fund, uh, which tends to look for projects of that sort that no single investigator would be able to mount. But if you put out an opportunity to bring a team together, you can do some pretty interesting things, and we want to be sure that we don't miss those opportunities. Many of those are these community resource projects that I talked about earlier, where the real goal is to empower everybody to be able to do what they were doing, except faster and more efficiently. But I do think that the main advances that happen in terms of our big insights uh, into life science are still going to come from individual investigators who are empowered by all of those additional technologies and data sets, but who have a hypothesis that's particularly groundbreaking and a clever way of designing a well-controlled experiment that basically changes the paradigm. That's how it's often been in the past. That's probably how it will often be in the future. The data science part of that is going to be increasingly important because those individual investigators may themselves be data scientists, and their creativity is not necessarily that they designed the perfect experiment at the bench, but they designed the way to look at this universe rapidly growing of publicly accessible data sets and pulled things together in a way that provided a new insight. But it didn't mean that they had to assemble around them 100 other people to help. They had the ability to do that. I'm hoping that in this room, there are a lot of data scientists who will ultimately emerge as that kind of investigator and who will be the ones that propel us forward. I think the analogy you made earlier on before the question about the relation, how this parallels developments in physics where, and it, I, I, I find that very striking where you have, uh, you have projects where everybody clusters around the Hadron Collider and there's a, a data set that's collected and there are hundreds of names on the paper. That's very akin to how you know, genomes were first done. And, um, and then what you have is you have the, the results of that is public data, which then is, act, is used by individual investigators yeah. to make very interesting discoveries, perhaps in concert with much smaller collaborative groups. And that seems to me very much where we're headed in, in, in the biosciences. And, uh, and that has other ramifications, as we know, we, you know how we think about making uh, the knowledge available that comes from this. So the whole preprint landscape, which is so uh, ingrained in physics and computer science, now is increasingly coming to biomedicine, which I think is a very great development. And I'm glad you brought that up. And Phil has been a remarkable leader in that effort to get the life science community to think about the advantages of preprints and to get over the fear that somehow you're going to get scooped if you put your data into one of the preprint servers. Uh, we have seen an amazing transformation in just the last three or four years, uh, thanks in large part uh, to your leadership and that of Ron Vale, to try to get people to realize why this is such a good thing for our field. Postdocs in my lab now, without even thinking about it, of course they put their paper up on the preprint server, either just before it at the same time that they're submitting it to peer review in some journal, because they want people to look at it. They want people to give them feedback. They know it's going to make it better. And it's also sort of a timestamp to say, I knew this at this point. Nobody can say they scooped me later because it's been marked uh, with the time that I have put this in there. It's just the right thing to do. I hope everybody in this room uh, who's involved in this and has the opportunity to go down that road is doing so. It's, it's taken hold, I think. So I think the in, an, another aspect of that is that it started off, you mentioned Ron Vale, it was very much a community effort to, to actually lift that. But what's, I think, incredibly important is the NIH listen. That there's, I didn't realize this before I went to NIH, but there are all these me mechanisms around requests for information that are actually really are, are taken enormously seriously that really make the difference that reflects what the community wants to see. 
and I think uh, that's, that's to definitely to the NIH's credit. Other questions? Don't be shy. Right here in the front, I think. Uh, hi. Um, is, this, is this on? Yes. Oh, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Collins, I worked with you in ENCODE Pilot um, a long time ago, so um, in Tom DeGeris' group. But so, I'm trained as a physicist. I'm a computational biologist. And we're talking about physics. So, in the physics model, you have theorists and experimentalists, as well as in chemistry. And I feel the Human Genome Project kind of put it out of, uh, in a wonderful disequilibrium, where you now suddenly have computation. Um, but when you think about the physics model, and I'm just going to ask if you're thinking maybe that's a long-term model, you have theorists that make potent predictions about nature that experimentalists in very separately confirm. Right now, I feel kind of the NIH culture and funding, uh, there's a modest amount of like funding for just pure prediction. But if you think about it, that's what physics and chemistry are like. Um, and I feel you might unleash a lot of like predictive modeling and, 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 and um, uh, if, if funding were available for pure prediction. I'm wondering your thoughts on that. It's a good question. I think with life science, unlike uh, chemistry and physics where you have remarkably robust theoretical models uh, for the behavior of atoms and molecules and energy, life science has been kind of murky in terms of exactly what are those fundamental laws. Uh, and of course, they are the same laws, but they're hard to perceive in a complicated system of life science. And so for the most part, it was a little hard to know uh, what kind of predictive models would turn out uh, to be worth investing in until we had more data. But that was the past. I think we are now at the point of having a lot more of that data. And so it is more uh, possible for that kind of uh, work to be supported. Maybe I'll point again to the brain, because I think we are maybe on the verge of uncovering some fundamental principles about how the brain works, about how memories are laid down and retrieved, about how circuits carry out complicated uh, functions such as processing visual information. And there's enough there that you could begin to say, OK, let's just fund some people to come up with uh, predictive models and then test those against the data. And we're starting to do that with the brain initiative. It's just a matter of finding the right time for the right part of the field where you've hit the sweet spot. Of course, I'm biased in this, but I certainly would like, uh, like a question here. I'd like to see more money put into computation that, and, and predictive modeling. Uh, but at the same time, I think it has been successful. I mean, I think the brain is one instance, but all, the whole emergence of the field of systems biology, sure. uh, I think, has really shown how what were initially fairly vague models in, say, metabolism and E. coli, now uh, are, uh, and they, were, you know, they were really predictive models. But now there's enough data and there's enough uh, analytics in them that they actually really work. That you can actually, you know, feed the inputs and the outputs, and you you, you get what you would expect. That's yeah. another great example, and I should have mentioned that as well. And protein folding and protein-protein interaction, your area of expertise, also, as we're getting better and better at actually doing that kind of modeling, uh, providing uh, computational predictions, is turning out to be pretty useful. And, and protein folding, the interesting thing is that in some way it was hand in hand with more experimental data. So, you know, we, yeah. uh, so I, th I think those are, you know, the fact that these, these two things have to work in partnership is really important. Got it. So I yes. have a follow-up question to uh, Excuse me. St Stefan's question here. Uh, I think oh, that, sorry. okay. Sorry. Uh, Dr. Collins, thank you. Um, you made the statement that these large-scale open data uh, sets empower researchers. I would just like to paraphrase that, um, that these uh, opportunities for establishing these large-scale um, genetic databases empower patients. And the question that I want to ask you is that we're moving quickly towards very large-scale sequencing. And right now, there is unprecedented opportunity for rare disease patient organizations to establish their own exome banks. Uh, which empowers them to attract researchers uh, in what they view as their patient interests. What I wanted to ask you was simply a technical question. Do uh, exome banks um, provide the uh, 
properly comprehensive genetic material for very um, profound research to be done, or should we wait for uh, large-scale access to genome sequencing? Mm. That's a great question. I think what you said is absolutely right, and I, I should have been more clear that these large-scale projects are not just beneficial uh, to researchers, but also to patients who are an anxious for having this technology reveal uh, answers to questions that might otherwise uh, get neglected, because rare diseases oftentimes have a hard time finding a cohort of investigators that want to work on their problem. But I think you've seen quite a dramatic step forward in that regard. Oftentimes when uh, exome sequencing uh, does get done on a particular rare disease and you find the answer in terms of a missense or a nonsense or a frame shift mutation occurring in multiple individuals, it lands you in a pathway and that links you up with investigators who are working on that pathway who had no idea that their research might be relevant to this particular rare disease. And I've seen this happen over and over again where those groups then come together fairly quickly to the great benefit of all. It doesn't always happen, of course. Uh, the exome sequencing for some rare diseases has not immediately produced answers. Uh, I'm, my own research lab at NIH is engaged in an uh, effort to try to uncover uh, the cause of a particular kind of hereditary facial palsy called Mobius syndrome. And we've generated a ton of exome sequences and still aren't quite sure what we're looking at because it's so heterogeneous in terms of the findings. And in, at least in one instance, uh, what was a sort of a bust when it came to exome sequencing has revealed itself uh, by going on to whole genome sequencing and finding out there was something more complicated. I don't know that's going to happen very often. Uh, I would say for the most part, uh, rare diseases are doing pretty well uh, by the exome sequencing strategy, uh, and whole genome sequencing may find you another sort of 10 percent that you had missed, but most of the time it's pretty hard to interpret still at this point. Um, one of the places that I think a lot of this excitement is happening is uh, this network uh, of centers now funded by NIH across the country that is looking at undiagnosed diseases where people who have had the experience, many of them for four, five, six, seven years, of having a very puzzling set of medical problems that nobody could make sense of uh, come in for a complete evaluation, all kinds of phenotype information and complete genome sequencing. And we're now doing pretty well. Something like 40 percent of those individuals turn out to have an answer. And out of that has also come uh, the new description of more than two dozen disorders we didn't know about before, but now we have detailed answers to. And for a few of them, a very clear indication about a different therapeutic approach that's provided benefit. So a long answer, but I think exome sequencing at the moment, fantastic opportunity, ought to be applied wherever we can figure out a way to do it. As the cost continues to drop for whole genome sequencing, which is now under 1,000 and which people are saying will get to $100 in the next five or 10 years, and then why would you do exome sequencing anymore because you want the whole thing? However, data science people, <laughs> that means you're going to have to deal with even more petabytes and more information you have to sift through to see what it means. One, one of the few advantages of actually sitting in this seat is I get to interrupt and ask questions myself. <laughs> and it made, me, it made me, as you were answering that, it made me think about um, the, the, rare, the whole rare disease community and how those communities sort of come together to create a cohort uh, when, when it's clearly, because it's rare, that it's not that big and it, that's so critical. And it's sort of, they're motivated to participate uh, because of their conditions. But what we also see is often motivation in areas and in, within, within uh, pop people who are not necessarily trained in these areas, but uh, often make these kinds of contributions. And we've, uh, we've, the NIH has tried to drive some of that forward with competitions, and I know, I'm not sure about the situation in the current government, but in the previous government, there was certainly a push to open up these uh, competitions to, to enable more people uh, to actually participate uh, in various ways in in this case, in, in potentially in healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, is that something that you, you feel that is oversold or it, it could be expanded or how do you feel about that? Oh, I don't think it's possible to oversell it. I think we are at the point where people are much more interested than maybe they were 20 years ago in the possibility of taking part in medical research, but they do not expect to be treated like human subjects 
and basically uh, told nothing about what happened. They want to be participants. They want to be at the table. They want to help decide what's going to happen to the data, who gets access to it. And most of the time, they want as many bright minds as possible to look at it. Certainly with all of us, this million strong program, the participants are very much telling us what they want to be done with the data. And they are very much telling us what they want to learn about themselves, including some of them want to see their complete genome sequence, even though we can't interpret it. They want to see it just to see that it's there. And I think that should be honored. And some are a little shocked by the idea that we would be delivering such data to participants. But I think we've arrived at the point where that's the right thing to do. Other questions? So I wanted to follow up on Stefan's question here, and uh, I can't help it but notice that you are sitting under a replica of Raphael's School of Athens, which symbolizes in the middle the two approaches to data science. One is purely empirical, driven by Aristotle, and the other is uh, the form is behind the data. There is a model behind the data uh, that drives this data. So the question is uh, a follow-up of what Stephen said. Should the next big project that we embark on be a systems biology project to understand the model that is driving the data that we are observing? Hmm. I guess it would depend on what the project is and whether that's the right fit. Um, I guess I am one who's often a little worried that we still insist um, in some of our instructions to grant applicants that you need to be stating your hypothesis, uh, which is basically a way of saying that you have a model. And if you don't have a hypothesis, it might not go well for you uh, in the peer review process. Uh, I think that means that some of our possible breakthroughs are being hypothesis limited, uh, not hypothesis benefited, but limited. And many of the things that we are now able to do don't require uh, you to start from that point. Uh, so, for instance, a, a lot of what we're now able to do with uh, deep learning uh, applied to very large databases, it kind of works because you don't have a hypothesis. You have a very complicated data set, and you know there's something really interesting in there. Uh, but you're not smart enough to sift through it uh, on the basis of some framework, because you don't know what the framework is, and you let uh, the deep learning or uh, uh, system figure out for you what the patterns are, even if it doesn't tell you uh, what the causative basis for those might be. I think that's pretty interesting, and I think we're going to be doing a lot of that. But again, when it comes back to what that individual investigator is doing, I think most of the time, building on big data sets that are available, they probably do have a hypothesis in mind, and that's OK. For the big science projects, well, it depends on what it is. I don't know what the hypothesis is for the brain initiative, other than we hypothesize that we can understand the brain, which doesn't sound, <laughs> doesn't sound very specific. Uh, uh, but as I said a minute ago in that previous question, if we get to the point, and I think we're getting close, where you could develop a decent models of what a circuit is doing, then we ought to be forming the next set of experiments in the brain initiative to test that. I think the fact that you said that you want to see more deep learning research done uh, at the NIH is going to make a lot of people in this room very happy, <laughs> including me. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, uh, hi. Over here. Up here. Way up here. Okay. Hi. Um, my name's Kate McDonough. I'm an undergrad biomedical engineering student, and we're working uh, with the internal medicine department to create data analytics programs to predict patients who are at risk of addiction, kind of going along with um, combating the opioid epidemic. And we just had a meeting this morning realizing that the oncology department actually had already done the research that we were hoping to do and implemented it. And the internal medicine ward had no idea. And we also know that IBM, Epic, and insurance companies are also trying to do this. But because the EMR data is so protected, it's very hard to collaborate. So. What do you think is the future for encryption of this data so that more people can collaborate on it um, and get their systems implemented? Thank you. 
Well, that's a very important and somewhat difficult question to answer because there's a lot of obstacles in the way. Uh, the vendors that supply electronic health records, I guess you're an EPIC system, have not always been as friendly as one would like to research. Recognize that those systems were really not built for research. They were built for one thing, billing. That was the point. <laughs> and I guess they're pretty good at that. But in terms of patient care eh, and research, not so much. <clears throat> So, so we have that obstacle. And then we have our own obstacles that we've created through government laws that are intended to protect patient privacy and confidentiality, called HIPAA. And those, in many instances, are, in fact, providing barriers to research that are a little hard to understand and maybe don't necessarily serve the needs uh, of the people they're supposed to be able to protect. So I appreciate you raising the question. This is not one that is going to be readily resolved, but I think there's a lot of reasons uh, to come up with creative ways to get around it, especially if you can figure out ways uh, to uh, anonymize or effectively anonymize data sets so that they can be shared. One of the things we're working on with all of us is something called Sync for Science, so that anybody who wants to donate their medical records to a research project uh, can do so, because it's their data, and they ought to be able to. And so a simple single button on your iPhone saying, I want my medical record and I want to send it to this researcher is something that we ought to be able to achieve. There's no particular barrier to that. And that gets you around all of the other obstacles uh, about uh, the uh, HIPAA protections of individual records because they're your records. So you just decided you wanted to make it available. And then it becomes much more straightforward. But that's one of a whole long list of things we need to do to try to empower the kind of research you're talking about. And I'm really sorry to hear you worked on this and some suddenly found out this morning you got scooped. That's a terrible thing to happen to anybody. <laughs> that's science. So, uh, uh, <laughs> we're, we'll take one more very quick question. OK. Who has a microphone? Uh, hi. So I know you mentioned that it's a great idea to expand opportunities for teaching quantitative thinking and computational skills to people in the humanities. And from my experience of teaching those skills to people, uh, a lot of students tend to feel very apprehensive about it. So are there any suggestions you have of lessening that apprehension in people? Thank you. <laughs> oh my, that could be a long conversation. Uh, the apprehension uh, has many stories behind it in most individual instances about why this is something that seems like it's going to be unpleasant, scary, and going to make you feel like you don't know what you're doing. Uh, and, and unfortunately, that's often an indictment of the way in which K through 12 education has been carried out. Because uh, if you ask sort of fourth graders uh, for their interest in areas uh, that are more quantitative, uh, you get a fairly strongly positive across the board. Yeah, that could be interesting. But by the time you get to 12th grade, it's not so much. And I'm afraid that a lot of that is because of the experiences people have had uh, with educational systems that were not forgiving, uh, were not respectful of the individual interest and, and uh, ability to quickly grasp uh, quantitative issues. So you've got to get people sort of past uh, that barrier and, and help them recognize that this is not going to be as painful as they think it is. Then on top of that, you really have to have educational systems that are user-friendly, that are interactive, that allow somebody to move at their own pace. And there's an awful lot up on the web now in terms of uh, MOOCs and other courses that will help with that circumstance. And it would depend a lot on sort of who your audience is, which of those would make the most sense. But I do think there are ways to get past this. But the first barrier, as you point out, is to get people over the apprehension, which all too many people have acquired by the time they get to college. So this morning I was sitting downstairs about a little after six wearing my data science t-shirt and <laughs> Francis came down and commented on it. He'd already, for his second cup of coffee, he'd already been working for well over an hour. I'd, actually, I, don't, I have no idea when you started, but, uh, but it was certainly way before me. And I think we're, so as a token of our appreciation for oh. you being here, and we know that you can actually accept this because it's worth less than $20. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, but oh, not much less, I should say. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's just been a real honor to have you here, and thank you very much for coming. We're very honored. Thank you. Uh, wow. and, and, and you get a frisbee as well. Oh, wow.